Department of Chemistry, Georgia State University. So today I will be discussing about our current work titled as Brownian Non-Gaussian Diffusion of Polystyrene and Plastics on a POPC Liquid Surface in Salt Condition. In our daily life, most of the things that we use are made with plastic materials and plastic pollution is a global problem too. If we look into this image, global plastic production is around to 70 million ton per year, whereas global plastic waste is around to 75 million ton per year, among which around 8 million ton per year, these amount of plastics are getting into the ocean system. Now what happens to those plastics? We know plastics are petroleum derived non-biodegradable products. So they get dissociated into smaller and smaller plastic molecules leading to the formation of microplastics and nanoplastics. Research says that plastics can easily get into plankton's bodies. And from this image, we can see from plankton's bodies, plastic can easily get into our bodies also. As per recent update, an adult human being can consume around 200 gram of plastics per year, which is not a small quantity. Here are the microplastic intake graphs by human body and from the two graphs we can see the amount of microplastic consumed as well as inhaled by human body is pretty high. This is the image of zooplankton's with microplastics in their bodies. But what about nanoplastic that has size ratio in between 1 to 100 nanometer, which is similar to the size ratio of different membrane bound protein as well as liquid molecules. So it is very important to look into the effects of nanoplastics on biological membrane. Now how nanoplastics interact with life cells? Here we can see the biological interaction of any functionalized polystyrene nanoplastics with human endothelial cells where the nanoplastics are getting into the cell and damaging mitochondria. In the second example, polystyrene nanoparticles are creating toxicity in yeast cells. Negatively charged polystyrene nanoparticles are going into the cell and creating toxicity whereas positively charged polystyrene nanoparticles are creating toxicity being present on the cell surface. So there are some theoretical studies regarding the interaction of nanoplastics with cell membrane. In the first example, we can see PET nanoplastics can go through the cell membrane and go inside the cell. Whereas in the other examples, we can see Differently charged polystyrene nanoplastics interact with cell membrane differently and they can even get dissolved in the POPC liquid bilayer with time. But experimental studies to support all these theoretical studies are still not well understood. And the reason is there is no such conventional analytical technique that can look into one single nanoplastic molecule. Now why it is important to look into one single nanoplastic molecule? Because plastic is very heterogeneous in terms of their structure as well as morphology. If we look into different monomers of different plastics, they are structurally different from each other. And that is why different nanoplastics interact with cell membrane in different ways. For example, PET nanoplastics can go through the cell membrane and go inside the cell, whereas polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, they can only be present in the cell membrane. So in our current work, we are interested to look into the effects of carboxy functionalized polystyrene nanoplastics on biomimetic membrane, but in future, 
we can also look into the effects of other nanoplastics. Now, describing the technique to study micro and nanoplastics, Raman spectroscopy is the most widely used technique. Here we can see the Raman spectra of different microplastics. Whereas in the second image, we can see the spectra and surface enhanced Raman image of a 100 nanometer sized polystyrene nanoparticle. But how will we get the dynamic properties of each nanoplastics? Why do we need the dynamic properties? Because to look into the interaction between nanoplastics and biological membrane, it is very important to get the dynamic properties of each nanoplastic. So, introducing the optical imaging technique, diffraction limit is a very common problem in each type of optical system. What does it mean? It says, if we keep two objects very close to each other, beyond this diffraction limit, we will not be able to differentiate the two objects. In 2014, a group of three scientists, they received Nobel Prize due to their contribution in super resolution field. Now, what does super resolution mean? It says, if you are able to localize one single emitter with nanoscale precision beyond this diffraction limit, you will be able to differentiate two different emitters that are very close to each other. And if you do it for multiple frames, you can get super resolution imaging or super localization tracking. In our work, we did super localization tracking. So what are the steps? The first step is to localize particles position, then connect their position frame to frame by using an algorithm to get time dependent trajectories and finally by using the trajectories we can do different types of statistical analysis. So here is our single molecule experimental setup. We used our home built TAR total internal reflection fluorescence microscope. Let me tell you how it works. Laser light is coming from this direction and falling onto the surface with a particular angle. The fluorophores within 100 nanometer region of the surface are getting excited and their fluorescence are being recorded by using an EMCTD camera. So we used microfluidic chamber setup having an inlet as well as an outlet for our experiment. We have our supported POPC lipid bilayer on the cover slip and the microfluidic chamber. We float the solution of polystyrene nanoplastics through heat in presence of salt environment. So here are the representative trajectories from our experimental system. Here each red line represents single polystyrene nanoplastic trajectory and after analyzing all the trajectories we got two different types of trajectory one is long trajectory and the other one is short or confined trajectory but the question is why did we use salt environment because NaCl concentration can not only increase the membrane rigidity of BOPC lipid membrane, it can also affect the nanoplastics uptake process in yeast cells. And that is why it's very important to look into the effect of nanoplastics on biological membrane in presence of salt environment. Here are the representative images of our membrane surface. And if you compare the two images, the number of nanoplastics interacting with the membrane surface in presence of higher salt concentration is higher compared to the lower salt concentration. From the number of particles on surface versus NaCl concentration graph also, we can see with increasing the salt concentration from 10 to 100 to 1000 micromolar, 
the number of particles interacting with the surface increases. But our conclusion is very qualitative in nature. We wanted to quantify our results and for that we did different kinds of statistical analysis. The first one is single frame displacement means how long one particle is moving from one frame to next frame. And after analyzing all the trajectories for a single type of data, we have seen two different types of population in our single frame displacement graph. The first one is short population corresponding to short displacement value and the next one is long population corresponding to long displacement value. With increasing the salt concentration, long displacement population decreases whereas short displacement population increases, which is clear from the exact population value versus NACL concentration graph also. The red line represents increasing short displacement population and the blue line represents decreasing long displacement population. The second type of analysis that we did is surface residence time, means how long one particle is staying on the membrane surface. With increasing the salt concentration, the probability of the particles being present on the membrane surface increases. From the average surface residence time versus NACL concentration graph, we can see the average residence time of the polystyrene nanoplastics in presence of 1000 micromolar salt is the highest. So, so far our conclusion is with increasing the salt concentration, long displacement population decreases whereas short displacement population increases and the probability of the polystyrene nanoparticles being present on the surface increases. Now, we became interested to know the diffusion properties of our nanoplastics. For that, we did MSD, mean square displacement analysis, and from our MSD graph, we have seen polystyrene nanoplastics in presence of buffer as well as salt environment are showing straight line, means they are showing normal or Brownian diffusion. Now, if we want to plot the distribution, Brownian diffusion should give a Gaussian distribution, and which is what we can see in the distribution in the diffusion of polystyrene particles on single DLPC liquid monomer. However, for Brownian yet non-Gaussian diffusion, all the MSD can give straight line which is the green line in figure B, but the distribution doesn't have a Gaussian shape. Rather, it can have Gaussian head exponential tail or it can have both Gaussian head and Gaussian tail. So, we did the same kind of distribution analysis which is called Van Hoof distribution for our data and we observed that with increasing the salt concentration, the shape of the distribution is getting changed from Gaussian to exponential. We also calculated the alpha 2 value which is a non-Gaussian parameter and the alpha 2 value for 1000 micromolar data sharply increases. We did time dependent distribution analysis for our only buffer and 1000 micromolar data because time dependent changes in the variance of the central peak of the distribution tells us apparent displacement of the particles during confinement. So for our buffer data we have seen around 0.4 micron of changes but for 1000 micromolar data the change was very very less which says there is apparently no displacement of the polystyrene nanoplastics on membrane surface during their confined state. Now, we would like to introduce a salt dependent transport model of our 
carboxy functionalized polystyrene nanoplastics on pyrofacilitated membrane where at low salt concentration the interaction between the membrane and the nanoplastics is less but with increasing the salt concentration the negative charge of the phosphate group are getting screened by the positive charge of the sodium ions keeping positively charged amine groups of the lipid molecules free towards the outer side of the membrane and that is why there is an electrostatic interaction between the positively charged amine groups of the lipid membrane and negatively charged carboxy functionalized polystyrene nanoplastics which leads to the confinement of the nanoplastics on lipid surface but what about chloride ions because chloride ions can also interact with the positively charged amine groups of pofc lipid membrane to answer that question we collaborated with the computational group for the md simulation study of our system and from their md simulated data what we have seen na plus ions localized in the closer proximity of the membrane compared to cl minus ions and that is why the interaction between positively charged amine groups of the lipid molecules and the negatively charged polystyrene nanoplastics dominates which leads to the confined motion of plastic nanoplastics on the membrane with this i want to stop here i would like to thank my supervisor dr chayan datta all my lab members my collaborators and finally sarvets for giving me this opportunity thank you